Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to Emory Climate Talks. My name is Eri Saikawa, and I'm an Associate Professor of Environmental Sciences at Emory University. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I hope you are hanging in there, although um, bad news don't seem to stop anytime soon. Um, this webinar series is made possible by our anonymous donor that supports our trip to the UN climate change negotiations, and this is in partnership with the Department of Environmental Sciences and the Resilience and Sustainability Collaboratory at Emory University. If you have not signed up yet, um, I say this all the time, but please do check out our website, climatetalks.emorydomains.org, and sign up for our newsletter. I've mentioned this last week, but we now have our own YouTube channel, and we are trying to increase our reach, so please do subscribe and please share widely. We will post the information on the chat box so you can subscribe to the newsletter and to the YouTube channel as well. Um, today's talk will also be available on the YouTube channel in the near future um, as we are recording this talk. We have your microphone muted, um, but if you have any questions during the talk, as, as always, um, please feel, feel free to use the chat function to type up the questions so that we can raise them during the Q&A session. So today I'm so excited to have Mr. John Lee Sutter. Sheila Teft, who taught climate change in society with me took, um, and took students to the UN climate change negotiations in 2017 and 2018, ma made this webinar possible. Um, she was going to co-host this, but unfortunately she is having an eye surgery today and is unable to attend. Uh, she sends her best regards and I will do my best to moderate uh, in her place. So you have to bear with me. Um, Mr. Sutter is an Emory alum, uh, and Sheila always praises John in her conversation, and so I'm sure she would have said great things uh, about him, um, very personal, if she were able to give an introduction. I will do my best. Um, Mr. Sutter is an award-winning journalist and filmmaker focusing on documenting cl climate crisis. Mr. Sutter is a National Geographic Explorer and CNN climate analyst. He has so many awards, I will tell you all. He has won the Livingston Award, IRE Award, Edward R. Morrow Award, Peabody Award, and has received two Emmy nominations. I was telling him that I wanted to have one of them, um, maybe sometime. <laughs> so he was a night visiting Neiman Fellow at Harvard and is a visiting instructor at the Pointer Institute. If you have not seen his work yet, it's most likely that you did not know that it was his work. Uh, just to give you a couple of examples, I'm going to stop sharing today's talk, but I will share some of the examples that he has done. So here you see the podcast I, hi I highly recommend. Um, this is the heat of the moment that he recently started. And then he is going to be talking about the new film, Baseline. I highly encourage you to sign up for the newsletter and then provide support by clicking here. You can give a uh, donation through this and I'm sure any amount that you can provide would be very helpful. And he has also done uh, the two degrees on the climate crisis uh, at CNN and also Vanishing. This is a CNN international documentary on extinction. So he is going to be telling us about his documentary as mentioned and other work he's been working on. And I'm sorry I've been talking too much. So I will stop now and uh, I will let John talk. But as I said, uh, if you'd like to jump in at any time, please feel free to write on the chat box and we will get to that during the Q&A. So thank you so much. Uh, John, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Eri. Um, and hey everyone, I'm really excited to, to be here at uh, the Emory um, community is really important to me, as is this this topic of the climate crisis. And I know there's a lot going on in the world right now, um, and so I appreciate you all taking time to um, to have this this conversation. And, and I'm I'm excited to you know have this be a discussion and, and answer your uh, questions. Um, so I'm going to do just a, a brief, like you know, 15 minute uh, a presentation about this new project I'm working on, which is called Baseline. Um, as Erie mentioned, and then uh, you know, and then I think we'll open it up and have um, more of a conversation about um, 
uh, about any and, and, and all of this stuff dealing with media and um, the climate crisis. So uh, <clears throat> hopefully the Zoom gods will cooperate. I'm gonna try to share <laughs> uh, my screen with you all. Okay, um, so let me start, uh, I'm just gonna play you a, a short clip that sort of introduces the, the, the main theme that I'm dealing with in this project. We're living in this sort of 10% world. No matter what you're studying or the metric, it turns out that when you look back in time, it used to be about 90% more of that thing. So the fish used to be 90% bigger. Um, we used to catch 90% more um, big fish. Are you all getting a video delay? It's it's sort of stuttering on 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 my end. Um, let's uh, let's look at this a different way. So um, uh, this is a, a researcher, Lauren uh, McClinchan, who's at Colby College in um, in Maine. And basically, she deals with uh, changes that take place over long periods of time and our ability or inability to notice them. And so what I was going to show you with this clip here is some photos that she dug up from a library in, in Key West, Florida. Um, these show like the daily trophy catch at one, uh, at one fishing dock, right? So you have the same time of year, the same place, different fishermen in different years pulling in like their catch that they're super excited about on that day. Um, you know, here you can see a catch in the 1950s. Um, if we inch forward and hopefully this will work, um, you can see in the 1960s, like a very noticeable change in the size in the species of these fish. Um, going forward a little more, 1970s. And then this is the 2000s. So, I bring this example up um, uh, in the context of this very like wonky academic term, um, which is shifting baseline syndrome. And it's, it's defined as a phenomenon of lowered expectations in which each generation regards a progressively poorer natural world as normal. So it, it comes from fishery science in the 1990s, this discovery that uh, because of overfishing and regulatory changes, that the fish in the ocean actually are are shrinking but if you look at those photos like the fishermen don't especially seem to notice that you know they seem excited about the trophy catches in recent years just as much as they did in the 1950s and you know through interviews with with these folks i mean you can you can tell that like they don't realize the magnitude of the changes um that are happening and i got really interested in this topic especially as it applies uh, to the climate crisis, um, which is sort of the uber, you know, slow moving environmental uh, threat uh, that we all face today. And I think, you know, one way to think about this is to kind of boil it down into just how we process, uh, you know, temperature around us. Like if I were to ask you, is today unusually hot or not? It, it's, it's a very difficult thing uh, to try to put into context and to answer and to try to get a sense of like the magnitude of what's happening. I, I remember being in a, a, a lift ride at one point, like back when that was a thing that you could still do safely. And um, this was in Dallas and I was talking to the lift driver and, and he said to me, uh, you know, like the weather here has been like sort of pulling like Powerball numbers. It's like 93, like 46, like 78. You kind of don't know what's coming up. And so you don't have a, a, any way to really um, you know, process this, this information. Um, and there's been some research into this idea of like how, uh, of this like psychological blind spot, right? Like our inability to process long-term change. Um, this is a researcher, Fran Moore at UC Davis. Um, and she, uh, you know, wanted to get a sense of like how we think about uh, heat in our day-to-day -day lives. And she looked um, to the place where everyone complains about everything, um, which is Twitter. And uh, she analyzed tens of thousands of tweets um, and, uh, and sort of came up with this estimate that our memory, the memory that we access when we're deciding whether today is unusually hot or not, is about two to at most eight years long. Um, 
and she's positing that that memory shifts forward with us through time, right? So if you imagine in reality, you see the red line where temperatures are going up and up and up. Um, our perception of that is the blue line. We sort of keep resetting our memory as we move forward through time and are therefore unable to really recognize and feel um, the magnitude of what's, what's happening. Uh, some people call this generational amnesia, right? Like this idea that we can't process change that happens across generations. And I got really interested in this and it really started bothering me because a lot of the work, because of the work that I've been doing as a journalist over the last, you know, 10, 15 years, um, I spent a lot of my time up very close to the climate crisis and, and, and kind of see and hear about the, the, the real suffering that takes place because of the extreme warming that we're uh, you know, unleashing as we burn fossil fuels. Um, this is a, a family in Honduras um, that I met uh, a little more than a year ago. Um, you probably heard about or read about the caravan you know, coming from Central America up towards the United States. Um, a big and underappreciated component of that was climate change, right? There, there's this intense drought in the dry corridor of Central America that was pushing people, including a member of this family, um, north uh, towards the US border. Um, this is a photo from the Marshall Islands in 2015. Uh, this is a country out in the middle of the Pacific that's so low-lying that it, you know, that as seas rise, even just like, you know, a couple meters, um, it could displace or render uninhabitable large portions, if not the entire, you know, um, territory of this nation. So you think about you know a language, a culture, a history, all at risk. Um, and this is from Puerto Rico. Uh, I spent about a year, year and a half for CNN going back and forth there uh, doing investigative work. And uh, this is a home of, of someone who several months after the storm was still living without a roof um, because of how slow uh, the aid was to get to that place. So I, I bring these stories up just to give you a sense of like why I care so much about this, right? Like I've spent a lot of time with people who are really struggling as a result of these big changes. And it, it's, real, it's, it's upsetting to me, this idea um, that we would start to normalize that, that over time we would, you know, obviously be alarmed in moments, right? When a new storm hits, a new heat wave, these things do register on our, our like do get our attention. Um, but what doesn't get our attention is, is the true magnitude of, of what's happening, which is this sort of slow moving um, crisis. Um, of course, we've had the data for a really long time to, to know what's happening. This is Charles David Keeling, who was one of the first scientists to start measuring the buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, he was with Scripps uh, in San Diego. Uh, you know, his name is on the Keeling curve, which is, you know, sort of measures the buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere over time. Uh, you know, we know from uh, maps like this one from NASA, like, you know, exactly what's happening with global temperature and the ways in which that's affecting droughts and storms and really every aspect of our world. Um, and again, we've known this for a long time, like this is a newspaper article from 1988 when uh, Jim Hansen, a NASA scientist, testified in front of the Senate saying basically like the era of global warming is happening and it's happening now where we're seeing these changes um, in this moment. Um, this is a passage from a book called Don't Even Think About It that I, I thought was really powerful. Again, it's just showing these sort of deadlines that environmental groups are putting on, uh, you know, ecological crisis like 1990, 2007, 2015. They keep coming up with, and I understand this instinct, you know, 10 years to save the planet, like how, however, five years to save the planet. But these deadlines keep pushing forward through time. Um, and in reality, we're in some ways having the same conversations over and over again. Um, and without realizing it, I've been part of this. <laughs> like this is a, an article I wrote for CNN in the lead up to the 2015 Paris talks. Um, you know, I was saying 100 days to save the world. Again, I think we just keep pushing this through time. And until this year, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, you know, greenhouse gas emissions have continued to go up and up. And, and I think that there's a lot of reason to believe that even if there is a dip um, this year because of the pandemic, that, you know, that's not really going to affect the long-term trajectory. 
Um, so I, you know, I started thinking, okay, what's the antidote? Like, how do we get our heads around this blind spot that we have? These, these, you know, shifting baselines, this form of generational amnesia um, that surrounds our thinking on the climate crisis. And I think, like, journalists are especially guilty of this kind of like now, now bias, right? Like, we exist in the intensely present moment. We like think in a very like tweet to tweet kind of way, um, and so. I spent some time talking with people outside my profession to try to get ideas about this. Um, one person I hung out with was this uh, researcher whose name is John O'Keefe. Um, he is at the Harvard Forest in Massachusetts. And you know he's one of like a large number of scientists that do longitudinal research, right? So they follow a particular issue over a number of years or decades and, and document it in a regimented way. Um, and John, uh, his project basically came about because he just liked this forest that he lived and worked in and um, just started taking notes about it, like sort of when the trees were blooming, when they were budding. Um, and those, those notes, uh, you know, became essentially like a 30 year record, like uh, sort of almost on accident, he created this massive amount of data um, that then the climate crisis sort of happened during that window, right? So he didn't anticipate that coming, but he was just taking these really detailed notes and all of a sudden his records became, you know, the most authoritative uh, data on how the climate crisis is affecting, um, you know, this particular patch of forest. So, you know, I take from this, he's someone who knows this forest really well. He knows it better than almost anyone. Um, and he's watching in a regi regimented way over a long period of time and is therefore able to counteract um, this idea that changes would happen without us being able to feel or, or see them. Um, there also are examples from the arts. Uh, this is a trailer from a documentary called 63 Up, um, which came out last year. Uh, and it's this project by Michael Apted. And he over, uh, in the 1960s, he decided to start interviewing a bunch of seven-year-old kids um, who were all, I think at that time, they were all in the UK. Um, and he decided to follow up with these same people every seven years. And in this most recent installment of the film, they're 63 years old, right? So you see an entire lifetime unfolding um, in these interviews. And it, it's something like really magical and powerful and nostalgic that happens when you watch a person age on film in this way. And I think you learn something about them by watching the changes occur that you would never ever get if you just sort of ask them to recap something in any one given moment, right? Change by its very nature, like exists over a period of time. It's just not often that our storytelling is able to exist on these sorts of timescales. And so I um, you know, am taking uh, ideas from the longitudinal sciences and from that 7UP project and am uh, launching into this effort called Baseline, um, which aims to document um, four communities on the front lines of the climate crisis uh, every several years between now and 2050. And again, this is my attempt at, at, at getting, uh, at taking like a longitudinal approach um, to telling the story of the climate crisis, which really is like an intergenerational saga, right? And we don't get to see it um, on that time frame, and, and it's partly a realization that the way that journalists, including myself, have been telling the story, that it's not enough just to tell it in any one given moment. You almost need to see uh, a long stretch of time in order to really feel um, what's happening, or at least that's that's my hypothesis. So um, hopefully my connection is is better now, and <laughs> this this video will um, play okay. But I want to introduce you to just one of these places, which is a a village called Shishmaref, um, kind of near the Arctic Circle in Alaska. Today is May 20th, right? 22nd today? I don't know. May, tw May 22nd? If the time was still the same way, like this from long ago, They'll be driving snow goes and dog teams and stuff like that. It, uh, lots of snow yet, huh? Mm hmm. Look at 
They want to relocate, I don't know where, someplace to cost her, I yeah. think. Yeah. You okay? Across the lagoon. I don't know. Huh? Maybe we'll be gone by the time they relocate the town, huh? Mm. Uh, there was lots of ground then at that time. Lots of ground? Yeah, lots of ground. Hardly any, any, any ground now. Uh, we're right down the edge now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm sorry for some of the video loading um, problems on, <laughs> on my end. Um, but this is uh, uh, Shelton and Clara Kakiak, and they, they live in, um, like I mentioned, in Shishmaref, which is a village that uh, where the, the permafrost is thawing, the sea ice is melting, um, and this is really like causing the land to cave away into the water. Um, there was one house that fell off of the edge. It was actually their next door neighbor's house. Um, and it's, it's, the town has voted multiple times to relocate because of all these issues. Um, they just haven't been able to find the funding uh, to do it, essentially. And so it's a place that is really, you know, its very existence is threatened by the extreme warming, which is in the Arctic is happening twice as fast as in the rest of the world. So it's kind of like walking into the future a little bit being up there. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I first visited this place for CNN in like 2009. So a while back. Um, and it stuck with me in part because of uh, an interesting tradition there that helps stories carry across generational lines, um, which is that when a new child is born in Shishmaref, traditionally, they're given the name of the most recent person who's passed away there. Um, and it's like, not an exactly literal form of reincarnation, but it's kind of almost like that. Like people talk about, oh, that kid has these qualities of the person that they're named after. It's like, almost like they're sort of back in the village through this, this new person who's been born. Um, and Shelton and Clara's son, Norman, um, died several years ago on a hunting trip. He fell through the sea ice on a particularly low sea ice year in an area that, you know, normally would have been um, trustworthy and safe. And there are a couple kids in the village who were named Norman after their son. Um, this Norman on the right, uh, he's like about 11 years old now, I think, um, uh, and wants to grow up to be a hunter and sort of knows this story that he's living into, right? And so, um, again, the aim of this project is, I just thought that it's such like a beautiful um, tradition and story and a way of sort of carrying meaning across generational lines. And so what I'm hoping to do with this project is to kind of give a megaphone to people who are living through extreme versions of the changes that are happening all around the world. Um, and to, uh, to use the film as a kind of memory, right? Like as an antidote uh, to this generational amnesia um, concept. And, and my hope is that it causes a different kind of emotional reaction to what's happening um, in, in terms of the climate crisis. Um, you know, I really do think it's like kind of an, an all approaches needed moment. Uh, like I said, there, there's a lot of really important things going on in the world right now from the pandemic to, uh, you know, anti-black violence and injustice. Like they're, they're super worthy, important topics. I think the climate crisis is this slow moving back burner issue that is one of the most profound and important things happening in our lifetimes. So that's the reason that, that I've chose to focus so much of my um, attention to it. So um, that is my uh, spiel about baseline. I'm happy to, um, I'll, Erie, I'll, I'll toss it back to you. I'm happy to talk about, about this project, about you know really anything related to, uh, to climate journalism. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I would like to invite everybody to type up the Q and a questions that you might have. I have the privilege to ask the first question. Uh, so if I can do that, um, you were mentioning about uh, COVID a little bit. So I wanted to ask you for your opinion. Sometimes I hear that, you know, it's impossible to talk about climate change now during the pandemic and with this Black Lives Matter movement going on. 
what do you think is the best way to communicate climate change in this very difficult times? Um, and is COVID affecting you and your, uh, your documentary in any way? Yeah, that's an important question. I mean, I, um, especially very early on, I was someone who thought there were moments where I felt it was inappropriate that journalists were trying to sort of shove climate change into the very forefront of the conversation about the pandemic. And the storyline that really bothered me most was this idea that somehow COVID was like fixing the climate crisis. I found that offensive um, and untrue, right? Like emissions are down, like air pollution is down in a lot of big cities um, around the world. Uh, and those things are silver linings, but they've come at, you know, the cost of like hundreds of thousands of lives at this point. So it's like, it, it's sort of weird to me, those connections. The most direct one that I've, I've seen and have written about some is like between uh, air pollution and the pandemic, right? Like this is a pandemic that attacks um, in some ways like the, the respiratory system and the lungs, right? And um, there's been some studies uh, and Ari, I know you've done some work on this too, like showing um, that reducing air pollution, pollution reduces your risk from the pandemic. And so the truth is that we would all be healthier if we found a way to get off of fossil fuels as fast as possible. Um, bonus is that we, you know, also can sort of blunt the effects of the climate crisis, which is like the Uber problem that we're causing. So I, I think that connection between the air we breathe and uh, the pandemic is, is an important one. Um, but there are ways in which it's separate, right? And I think like, um, CNN ran a documentary by featuring like Bill Weir, who's the, the one of their climate correspondents um, uh, during the pandemic. And it was just full on about climate change um, and didn't even really put it in the context of COVID. And I actually found that to be kind of refreshing and smart. Like, I think that it's still, there's still other topics that are important to, to discuss right now, even though, you know, there are, there's a lot, a lot, a lot in the news. Um, I think sometimes some of the missteps I see are, are trying to just like force overlaps. That said, there are, there are, I mean, in terms of like the Black Lives Matter movement, environmental racism and injustice is also very real. And so I've, I've seen a lot of smart reporting um, on that, which is that, you know, like black and brown people disproportionately are subject to um, the effects of air pollution and other, you know, types of pollution that, that cause a range of health, uh, you know, uh, negative health outcomes make people sick, basically. So I think it is important to talk about that all the time and right now, um, especially. Oh, and then in terms of the documentary, um, like everyone who's working in media right now is finding new ways to do everything. And so one thing we're experimenting with actually is, um, is uh, uh, like giving phones to some of the, the story subjects and asking them to document certain aspects of their lives. Um, I, I don't, it's kind of to be seen like exactly how that um, works in the main project, but I'm excited about how that's going so far. Um, and there are guidelines for how you can uh, film during these times. It's, it's the travel that's like tricky and it's like the safety of subjects is what I'm most concerned about. So a remote place like that village in Alaska, like the most important thing is to not be the person or the project that, that would carry something um, into that place. That'd be awful. So it, it's, it's sort of hit a pause in our production in some ways, but you know, it's still uh, a very like active um, um, project and everyone's looking for workarounds um, like the Sundance Institute and some others have put out guidelines about independent filmmaking um, during this era and you know it includes things like wearing a mask and other protective equipment and also if, if you're filming like doing that from a distance using longer lenses like there are certain you know techniques you can use to try to to minimize uh, any risk if you are going out into the field. Um, I see a lot of reporters working through Zoom uh, and asking subjects to record certain aspects of their own lives and interactions to try to get a as good of a sense as they can about what's going on from uh, a safe distance. Great. There are so many questions now, so <laughs> I will turn <laughs> to the questions, uh, go by one by one, but please um, continue putting the questions on the chat. So the first question, um, 
asks, what has your experience been as a um, National Geographic scholar? How did you get involved with National Geographic? Yeah, I, um, I love National Geographic and have um, my whole life. So I'm thrilled to be even like in a small way um, involved with them. And I'm in their Explorer program. Um, they, uh, which means they, they gave me a grant to kind of get this baseline idea started and to try to figure out how to make it, how to make it work. Um, they, they fund, uh, a number of storytellers and like really a lot of like scientists, um, through, uh, that program. And I think, I, I don't know what their, the precise aim, but it seems like a lot of times they're funding work that has some level of ambition that, that puts it outside of, you know, what a single news outlet might, uh, undertake or they're, you know, they're interested in like new ways to explore the world. So I think they're excited about um, kind of looking at time in a new way with relation to the, the climate crisis. So um, that's my involvement with them, which has been just like a, a dream. Like I, you know, went to an event in, in DC at their headquarters in January, like back when, you know, again, travel was a thing. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, they had some of their Explorer grantees from around the world, you know, making, presentations and talking about their projects and it's just it's been really inspiring um uh to be part of that network um i think they do really fabulous work i think a uh, related question so we're, i'm changing the um <laughs> i'm not i'm not saying exactly in the order that has come in but i think this is more related so the next one is what advice would you give to an undergraduate interested in environmental journalism or environmental science communication um, I, the main advice would be to do it. Like we need you, like this is, you know, um, climate change, health, science reporting, all these things are acutely important right now, um, and are just going to keep being important or become even more important going forward. And so I would say, uh, don't be discouraged, follow your passions and like make it happen. I do think news organizations have the conversation about climate in particular within big news companies has changed a lot in the last, I don't know, like even few years, really like five. Uh, I mean, the Paris Agreement uh, was a tipping point of sorts. There's the IPCC report that came out a little bit, you know, later that had this, um, they wouldn't have called it like an 11, 12 year deadline, but it did, you know, have this sort of uh, stat embedded in it, which was the, you know, to really have a hope of limiting warming to the international targets of like, you know, 1.5 degrees or two degrees. So hope to do that, we've got to, you know, rapidly cut emissions like in, in half in like a decade and, you know, to like net zero by 2050. And so the challenges associated with that, um, uh, and, and how people and governments are responding to it is, is just so important. I mean, I think that there's a big push right now in investigative journalism to go in that route, right? Like there's been this growing recognition that any fossil fuel pollution that's happening is, is damaging. Like we're, our carbon budget is very small at this point. And so we're, we're, we were running out of time decades ago and now it's like truly alarm bells like should be screaming in all directions so i i just i think uh i i love that you would want to pursue that i think taking courses in environmental science and in communications and uh in media um the that will give you a leg up on on people who don't have that scientific grounding um and uh yeah to go for it there's there's definitely like an exciting place for that in the media landscape The next question is, um, are any of the baseline locations in the southeastern U.S. which is likely to be very hard hit? Um, that's a good question. They're uh, not as I have it currently formulated. Um, one is in the, um, in the western U.S. It's like a drought heat story. Uh, one is in the Marshall Islands um, because of sea level rise. Uh, one's in Alaska. Um, and then one deals with uh, the frequency of like hurricanes and storms. Um, but I agree with you, like, especially as you overlap, um, uh, you know, things like 
income inequality. Like there, there have been some studies that I, I'm, I'm sure you're referring to that um, about like who's going to be hit hardest economically by by climate change. And in the U.S., like a lot of those places are in the southeast, and it's because people are very vulnerable already and the changes are fairly stark. So I think if you're in uh, the Southeast and in and around Georgia, Atlanta, like all, the, there's so many really, really, really crucial stories. Um, you know, you look at the floods earlier this year in like Jackson, Mississippi, like th these are intense and important and like now stories. I think if I can impress anything on this group, the fact that this is, this is a present tense right now and like past leading up to this story. I think I, I get frustrated with conversations about climate that are only future tense. Um, you know, they're only talking about 2050. Uh, they're only talking about the distant future. And it's always like this thing that is going to happen. But, you know, especially because of climate attribution science, which is basically this line of work where, you know, it's kind of like, uh, climate forensics in a way, you know, it's sort of looking for our fingerprints on any single weather event. Um, we're getting better at that, at saying like this heat wave, this storm was supercharged by us in this way. Not that we caused it to happen, like, um, but that we're making these dangerous events worse and more dangerous and more frequent or more intense. Um, and so I think there, there's been evidence of that in the Southeast in lots of ways and, you know, sort of extended Southeast, if you think about what's happened in Houston over the last several years with, you know, Harvey, et cetera, like places like that are living uh, like this climate intensified moment, like now, you know? And I think that we have to start talking about those events in, in that way. Um, how did you go about finding your subject for this documentary? How did you go about getting funding for this project? <laughs> um, so it's, it's still getting funding. It's like an evolving process, right? Um, but I, I've been lucky to have some some grants uh, to support the development of this work. Um, and and I was super lucky that I got I got a visiting fellowship at the Neiman Foundation at Harvard um, to study uh, like sort of long term storytelling. Like I was mentioning, the guy at the Harvard Forest. Um, longitudinal sciences um, and I also spent some time there researching like okay what would be good locations to focus on and um, I kind of thought about it as like they each have a distinct threat you know like so in Alaska it's uh, like the rapid warming and the, the thawing of the permafrost and the sea ice in a place like the Marshall Islands it's about sea level rise so all of these things are like inextricably linked but it the climate crisis sort of displays itself in different ways in different regions um and so i was looking for that i was looking for geographic diversity i um it, i was also looking for places where i like had uh, a connection and already some level of commitment so i i've spent a lot of time in that that village in alaska i have maintained relationships with people in the marshall islands since i went there um for cnn um, and especially because of the long haul nature of this, I, uh, that was not all of the calculus for me, but part of it, like where, um, where do I know people well and, and where do I feel like I, I understand the community to some extent and could get to know it a lot better, um, by making more of an investment in terms of the time, um, uh, that I spend there. Cause those, you know, uh, relationships definitely, um, matter. So it was like a combination of kind of my own career history and also thinking about what are the most important climate signals and where is that like being acutely felt. And then the last factor is this idea of memory, right? Like where are people really smart about, uh, where have people outsmarted this idea of amnesia, generational amnesia? And in Alaska, I think they kind of have, right? Like they have ways in which stories are much longer than than we typically tell in the news media, at least, or in big cities sometimes. So that connection to place and longevity of that storytelling was important to me too. Providing international platform and humanizing the issue of climate crisis are a few powerful ways that journalists empower communities who may be most susceptible to climate change. 
However, what are your thoughts about the role that journalists have in framing narratives so that it uplifts communities, given some of the more degrading perspectives that people may hold about those living in low resource remote settings? Um, that's a smart question. Um, I think, uh, I mean, one way that I, in all of my work on climate, on other topics too, um, I think the more fully you show someone as a unique human and individual or as a place, as a unique um, and complicated place, uh, the better chance you have of like, of just sort of reflecting the truth of a story and not getting caught up in, um, in stereotyping or like casting a community as, you know, uh, like victims of something. I mean, there are ways in which um, I think one of the terrible inequities of the climate era is that the the people and places doing the least to cause this problem are often suffering the brunt of the impacts. And I think it's important to state that plainly. Um, but, you know, it's not a victim narrative. Like this this community in Alaska, right? Like they have formed committees and done research and like plotted uh, relocation sites and mapped them and started planning like what a new version of their, their community or, or an extension of it, like if they don't uh, want to abandon the current site entirely, like what that all uh, would look like. They sent students to the cli UN climate talks to like speak up um, about what was happening. In the Marshall Islands, there's been an incredible amount of like art created in reaction to the climate crisis that's ha that's been very moving um, internationally. There's a woman, Kathy Jetnell Kedgener, who um, is a young mother and a poet, and she spoke in front of the UN and read a poem about, about not wanting her child to grow up without a country. And it, that was very moving for me, for a lot of people who were there and who heard that um, or saw it later. Uh, and, you know, she's, and, and a lot of other people, mostly like, you know, a lot of people in the arts community there have really rallied around doing things to, um, to be like an active resistance to what's happening, right? So it's not, it's not like a, again, not a victim um, narrative. Like one interesting thing happening there is, is this project by this, uh, kind of led by this guy named Alison Kalin. Um, to teach Marshallese wayfinding culture. Um, uh, like historically, Marshallese people have navigated between these really low lying islands, which you can't see at any distance, right? Like they just look like ocean. Um, uh, the traditional way Marshallese people navigated between them was by like feeling the action of, wa of the waves like in their guts, like in their stomach. It's not navigation by star charts, it's navigation by like wave charts. And, you know, he and some others have really tried to like revive that technique with young people. Um, again, I think the more you look at the full humanity of a place and of individuals, like the more you see how complicated this is. And there are terrible inequities baked in um, to what's happening, but you know, everyone is like their own person. And I think I, I try to keep that front of mind. Um, I'm going to come back to David, but first I'm going to go to this one because I think it's more related. What has your experience been as someone reporting on a community to which you don't belong? Has there been any pushback with entering a community with the intent of document, documenting its experience? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good um, question too. And I think that there ideally should be both kinds of stories and I, I support uh, a push that's happening definitely in the documentary world, in the arts world, um, and to some extent in the journalistic world too for people who are living through a certain experience or um, you know, come from a certain place or from a certain perspective that they're empowered to tell and given a megaphone to tell those stories. Like I, I hate it when people say like, uh, sometimes you hear people say like, oh, you're like giving this community a voice. Like, no, like people have voices, like they need a megaphone, <laughs> like a lot of the time. And so I see that as my role, like I have access to various megaphones because of my journalistic work that, uh, you know, unfairly aren't present everywhere. And so um, 
I try to use that in a fair way, but they're, they're for sure ethical complications and logistical complications and like all sorts of things um, with being an outsider. Um, like I said, I think that's where the relationships matter. And I am definitely looking for ways to try to break down that power dynamic. And, and I think asking people to be somewhat involved in the creation of at least part of the storytelling that will go into this is in, important to me. I, I did a number of projects um, while I was at CNN with um, with iReport, which was like CNN's kind of like early take on on like a version of like news YouTube sort of thing. It was like you submit your own videos uh, and they become part of CNN. And I, I, I did a couple uh, projects with them that I, I found it to be like really powerful, this idea of like uh, kind of a group created work. So I think um, there are various ways that people are are looking and thinking about that. It is it is front of mind for me. I do think it's possible to, to be an outsider and to tell someone else's story. Um, but I think that that there are, you know, you need to sort of practice the empathy and and the the skills you need to do that artfully. Um, and I also think that I'm in favor of diversifying the ranks of journalists, diversifying the ranks of filmmakers, and uh, whenever possible, having stories that are told from within. I, I think that the truth is that there are strengths about about both in some strange ways. And like I, um, like, so I'm from Oklahoma. I grew up near Oklahoma City. Um, I've seen work done in and about Oklahoma that I one there's a book called boomtown that this guy sam anderson wrote about oklahoma city like a a year or so ago and i loved that book and i was thinking like i wouldn't have been able to do that because i wouldn't have seen this so clearly you know because i you just sort of i there were things i accepted as just normal about the place because i was because i grew up there and because it's it's what i i know really well um and so i think that i that often like some sort of collaborative uh, solution is 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 a good one because sometimes at least a sounding board that's outside a particular place um, can be helpful in terms of translating what's going on to a, a global audience yeah that's such a great point but I think it's also a good segue to the next question um, at this polarized moment in the US how do you educate across the divide is COVID helping the education in some perverse way that is such a good and challenging <laughs> like question. I, I think about this a lot and I think um, this is a non-answer, but like I think this is really, 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 really hard with a lot of topics right now, but with climate change in particular. Like, you know, any storyteller, you wanna think about your audience. Um, you know, who's reading this, who's watching this and how do you answer whatever questions they might have in their head? What base level of knowledge do you have to communicate in order for them to like, come with you into that story. And there's this uh, project at Yale that has uh, done a lot of surveys on people's attitudes about climate change. And they they have one report that's called like the six Americas. And they basically decided that there were like six kind of buckets of the ways that people think about (laughs) climate in the US. And they're very different, right? All the way from people who are just like, so alarmed that this is the only and most important issue in the world to those who think it's just this giant conspiracy. And it's really difficult to tell a story that communicates effectively to all of those publics. Um, So I do try to like put more information than I might think is needed into the story to like kind of explain what is known about global warming and that it's caused by fossil fuel pollution and also by you know like deforestation and some other things but you know that mostly it's fossil fuel pollution and that we've known about that for a long time and that this is kind of these are the stakes right like that we we have to change this and um, in this timeline otherwise all these negative things are going to keep happening and getting worse I, i don't assume that people understand the mechanics of that even though I wish that everyone did. Um, that two degrees project that I did with CNN, like every story was based on a question member, that, a question that came from an audience member. And um, a lot of the questions we would get were really simple, like uh, questions about how climate change works or what the effects are, or like what the best solutions are. And that, you know, kind of taught me that like the more of that 
background material that you can kind of like tuck into the story, like the better, just because I think there are a lot of people who just aren't on the same page about what's happening and, and why. Um, also, just because I come from a really conservative place, uh, I, I think about that and I try to think about like, okay, how do people in like, you know, Oklahoma, like how would they react to this? How would they read it? And it, at least I try to make some tweaks and accommodations to try to hope to bring people along. But, you, you know, you have to know that not, um, not everyone is going to respond to every story. And I think that's okay too. So there are two questions um, related to climate change skeptics. The first okay. one asks, uh, any advice on how to convince or communicate with those climate change skeptics? And another one asks, uh, climate communicators often have to deal with climate change, climate deniers. Have you ever had an experience like that? And if yes, how did you handle it? <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, those are really good questions. Um, so quick story as segue. Yeah, I spent, um, if you Google Woodward, Oklahoma and my name, uh, you'll find a CNN story that I did in the county that at the time, based on those Yale surveys, was estimated to be the most skeptical in the country. So this is the place where like, I don't remember the percentage, but it was the highest percentage of people who were saying that climate change is not caused by humans. Um, and I think that's since changed, but it was in that moment. Um, so yeah, I spent, a, I spent some time there. Uh, if you are a person who writes about climate change and you're on Twitter at all, like, you know, you're, it's unavoidable that you will get a lot of that feedback. Um, and like I said, I'm from a conservative place. And so I, I, I know and am friends with and close with people who don't think this is real or who are skeptical about it being a big deal. Um, my advice in terms of how to have this conversation is, well, like A, to have it, like those same Yale surveys say that, uh, I can't remember the percentage, but it's like the vast majority of people in the States like never talk about climate change. Um, they rare, fairly rarely it's getting better, but like see stories about it in the media and they don't have interpersonal like conversations about it. It's awkward, uh, it's polarizing, um, but it needs to be talked about. So that's, that's A, like do it. And even if it's awkward, then it's better than not. Um, B is that I, I'm, I'm personally skeptical of like efforts to convince. Like I don't think that necessarily works. Like there was one time where I got in kind of a, like a verbal like fact war with a, a farmer who was in that county in Oklahoma. And he literally pulled a chart that he'd clipped from some ag magazine out of his pocket that he was, you know, saying disproved, uh, global warming and it was like very cherry picked and whatever but like so we got in a discussion about those details and this chart and what it didn't show and all these things like you're not going to win that conversation it just ends up being frustrating and like it's it's more about identity than it is about those facts i think um which is frustrating right um as someone who cares about facts uh um but it's about like, you know, what are the people in your group, however you define that, religious, political, ge geographic, like how do people talk and think about this? And if you're bucking those norms, that's hard. So I think like starting from a place of like everyone's a person and, and is, you know, start with the assumption that, that someone is reasonable and like and that their point of view that you want to understand it and that, you know, it's it's not it's not like stupidity. It's really not like um, it's, it might be getting the wrong information, but it's, it's, these are complicated views and complicated people. And so like, I try to sometimes engage that conversation. And if someone starts asking you about it, like I've definitely had people who are like very hardened, like climate skeptics uh, after I've spent a lot of time with them like just ask me stuff and and then I'll you know volunteer they'll be like well well what do you what do you think about this like you must think something if you're like running around the world reporting on this um and you know and I'll, I'll and I'll offer that um and I think that that's a better entry point like no one wants to be lectured no one wants to be preached at um and so I think I often start with the question approach like I just want to understand where they're coming from and if you can find uh, common ground, then that's great. It's true that like in polling, 
the solutions to the climate crisis, like things like, you know, government investment in renewable energy, even like the clean power plan, like these things in polling, like pretty large majorities of Americans support them. Um, and it's too bad that, you know, we don't get there faster and we, we end up fighting a lot about, uh, you know, details of the science and what's known and not, not known. Um, the other Uber thing I wish were happening is like more teaching in schools. I wish that this was brought up as just a matter of fact thing in science classes and wasn't uh, politicized. And that if those conversations were had and had early and in a frank and open and, you know, curious way, and uh, then I think that would solve a lot of the problems for, you know, upcoming generations. So there are several that want to be like you, I'm sure. And one of the question goes, how would you recommend getting a foot in the door when starting out as a science communicator? Um, that's a good question. So, I mean, there are so many paths, right? The media landscape has changed a lot. It's deconstructed in some ways. And that means there are like new and different and always evolving opportunities. And so I think find whatever way you can to start uh, practicing your craft and honing it and putting yourself out there. Um, I think you could do that on social media. I think you could do that like on medium. I think you could write a blog. I think you could start your own podcast. I think just start doing it. Like I, um, I, so I graduated from memory in 2005. I had a brief journalism fellowship in Florida after that. And then I went to work at the Oklahoman, um, which is the big newspaper in Oklahoma City, um, which again is where I'm from, and um, worked there for a while. I got laid off from that job uh, because newspapers like are really struggling and, um, and have been for a long time. Um, and after I got laid off, I, I like still, I thought environmental issues in Oklahoma just were and are so important and that's what I was covering. And uh, I just started a, a, a blog version of what I was doing essentially and I still had interviews and stories and things in there that I was doing as I was looking for other jobs. And I think when I went to interview at CNN, that, that stuff like that helped, right? Like sh being able to show that you have like such a passion for this, that you're just doing it on your own and, and don't wait for permission, I guess is my main um, piece of advice to just to get started. And that, um, that practice will make you better. And also I think will be attractive to, to um, potential employers or to publications that might buy your work because you need to be able to show a publication like okay here are things that I've written and it's kind of like a chicken egg thing to like okay well how do I get that experience and like internships are a great way um, and also uh, the internet has you know democratized media in a in a big way and so you can just start doing it um. uh, okay so the last question um is how do you encounter people who feel bogged down by all the negative climate news and wish for some hopeful message? Yeah, that's a, a, a good one. And I will admit to having felt very bogged down in this at, at various points. Like, I mean, when I was in when Puerto Rico for, I wasn't fully living there, but I was going there for like several weeks at a time and going back and forth to Atlanta where I lived then. And, um, and every time I would go back, I would hope like something has changed here, right? Like there's some sort of response that's made this better. And usually it was just like shocking to me, like how little had changed and like feeling the weight of those stories. Cause I was, I was investigating the people who weren't counted in the official death toll um, from Maria. So I was talking to, you know, widows and other people who like lost family members in the storm, like for weeks and weeks and weeks. And um, it was very heavy, the weight of those personal stories and also the weight of like knowing that storms like that are being made worse by us and that this is going to be, you know, this is an isolated thing. Um, uh, like that's probably the most down I've, felt and it just felt like okay these systems are so huge like how are we going to change them i don't think people get this uh or are responding um but i i truly if you look at like the uptake of uh you know renewable energy technologies if you look at polling if you look at um 
there are a lot of data points you can seek out that that do have a lot of hope. I think that things are moving in a good direction in lots of spheres. It's just not happening anywhere near fast enough. And so I think um, that there's a need for both perspectives to be out there, right? There, I, some of those pieces I was writing for Puerto Rico definitely had that tone of like being very, very dire, right? And I, and I and I thought that it was almost false to inject like too much hope into some of those. And I that this podcast I've been hosting for foreign policy is all about hope, right? Like every episode is about some aspect of the climate crisis and specifically focused on like people and entities that are trying to fix that, right? And like the real things that are happening now that just need a light to be shined on them and like some umph and the form of money and regulation and whatever else, a carbon tax to, to be put behind them uh, to get it to happen in a wider scale. And I mean, I look to uh, like Greta and the youth climate movement, the sunrise movement in the States, like these, uh, you know, the young activists like really give me a lot of hope as someone who's like in his late, 30s like that's a different enough generation that like there's an enthusiasm there that I find very infectious and that keeps me um, going and the truth is we don't have like a choice like we have to believe that this can change so that we can make that a reality because the world if we just keep on this same path is not one that any of us want to live in and we don't want to have future generations inheriting that so I think I'm glad you asked about hope. I think there is hope. We have to keep hope front of mind. We have the technological solutions in front of us. We really do know how to fix this in all the ways. It's just having the public and the political will to to force these solutions to be adopted much much more rapidly. Well, thank you so much, John. This has been wonderful with so much uh, discussion as well. Um, I, can't, I mean, I'm, I'm sure everybody is clapping and there's so many um, messages coming in thanking you. Um, it was so great. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in as well. Sorry, we've gone a little bit uh, over time. I uh, just wanted to, um, before we send you off, we will be having another webinar on July 13th at 3 p.m. Uh, another Emory alumna, uh, Sandra Kwok, who is the founder of CEO Ten Power, will be talking after the July 4th weekend. So um, I hope you can join us. Thank you so much, John, again for coming. Uh, we will be posting this on the video uh, YouTube. So if you've missed anything, you can go back and check it again. <laughs> so with that, um, thank you again. Stay safe and we will see you in two weeks. Thank you so much. Thank you, John.